This is Dr. Ankur Shah, and this will be a talk on rheumatoid arthritis. In this talk, we will give a brief overview of rheumatoid arthritis, which at times I'll refer to as RA. In particular, we will cover some of the clinical features of RA and touch on some of what's known about the pathophysiology of this disorder. Finally, we will talk about therapeutics that are out there and how we'll use them to help our patients. Here is a basic outline of this talk. We will start with a patient presentation and then go through the various topics listed here. Let's start with the case. A 48-year-old female presents to your primary care clinic with pain and swelling of the knuckles on both of her hands for the past three months. She states that symptoms tend to be worse in the morning. After waking up, she feels that she has stiffness in her joints that lasts up to 90 minutes before she can loosen up. She's had some very mild improvement with ibuprofen, but feels that symptoms may be getting worse. She's noted some increased fatigue as well. These new symptoms have piqued your interest, and you consider a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So what is rheumatoid arthritis? It is the most common chronic inflammatory arthritis. We will go over the clinical features in a few slides. In terms of epidemiology, the prevalence is about 1% in the U.S. and Europe, although this can be varied based on ethnic background. The incidence, or the number of new cases, is approximately 40 per 100,000 persons per year. The peak age of onset is between 40 and 70 years old. Like many autoimmune and rheumatologic diseases, women are affected in greater numbers compared to men, at a rate of 2 to 3 to 1. What are the clinical features of rheumatoid arthritis? The hallmark of disease is symmetrical swelling and pain or tenderness of the joints. Typically, the major joints involved of the metacarpophalangeal joints, also known as MCP joints, as well as the proximal interphalangeal joints, also known as the PIP joints, with the distal joints relatively spared. Disease-specific deformities of these joints may be observed as seen here. The top picture represents a boutonniere deformity with the PIP held in flexion and the DIP held in extension. The bottom picture represents a swan neck deformity where the PIP is held in extension and the DIP in flexion. The axial spine, and most importantly the atlantoaxial joint in the cervical spine, can be affected which can have potentially serious neurologic complications. The lower spine is rarely affected by RA. In addition to these findings, patients will often endure stiffness of their joints, primarily in the morning. Stiffness will last over an hour, which contrasts with degenerative or osteoarthritis where stiffness generally lasts 30 minutes or less. Generalized symptoms such as increased fatigue are frequently noted. The joint involvement also, in general, differs between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, and the pattern of involvement can help differentiate the two. As mentioned, RA typically involves the proximal joints such as the wrists, the MCPs, and the PIPs. Osteoarthritis, on the other hand, initially affects the distal interphalangeal joints, with the main proximal joint involved being the carpometacarpal, or CMC joint, near the thumb. This is a busy slide here to demonstrate only that a multitude of manifestations outside of the joints have been observed in rheumatoid arthritis. Of these, some are fairly common. Keratoconjunctivitis, or dry eyes, and xerostomia, or dry mouth, are collectively known as sicka symptoms and can be seen. Interstitial lung disease, hypoandrogenism in males, rheumatoid nodules, primarily around the elbow, osteoporosis and anemia of chronic disease are also commonly seen extra-articular manifestations. It is important to also note that patients with rheumatoid arthritis are more likely to develop lymphoma and vigilance for this complication is necessary when you are following these patients. So how and why do people develop rheumatoid arthritis? This is a complicated question with no one answer. Genetics likely play a significant role. The gene for human leukocyte antigen subtype, known as HLA-DRB4, is seen in many patients with rheumatoid arthritis, although not thought to be causative. In terms of environmental factors, a history of tobacco smoking appears to be prevalent in patients with RA 
and confers a more severe disease. Infection has also been implicated as a triggering event for RA, but again, no causative organism has been consistently identified. Porphyromonas gingivalis has been strongly associated with periodontis and rheumatoid arthritis, as well as potentially part of the mechanism leading to decreased tolerance of autoantibodies. Viral infection of various types have also been identified in the joints of patients with RA. Much is known about the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis, and nearly every component of the immune system plays a role. We will go into a little more detail in the next few slides, but the innate immune system is comprised of dendritic cells that can activate the adaptive immune system consisting of T and B cells. Macrophages are also part of the innate immune system and are important in the progression of inflammation and produce a very important pro-inflammatory cytokine called tumor necrosis factor, or TNF-alpha. T cells coordinate the progression of inflammation and communicate with B cells, which produce the autoantibodies that are important in tissue damage, as well as aiding in diagnosis when identified. Finally, the immune system also activates cells involved in bone formation and degradation, ultimately leading to bone erosion and damage. This is a pictorial representation of what I just discussed in the previous slide. There are some details on here that you will not need to know, but knowing the players involved is important, especially considering that many of these are targets for new therapeutics. In patients with certain genetic backgrounds who are exposed to environmental triggers such as smoking or infection, antigen-presenting cells, usually in the form of dendritic cells, are activated. They in turn activate self-reactive T cells through a cell surface interaction. Two important subtypes of T cells, Th1 and Th17, are particularly important in promoting inflammation. They produce a number of cytokines, the most important of which for our purposes is TNF-alpha. The T cells then coordinate the attack on joints and bone in a number of ways. They stimulate B cells, here in purple, to produce autoantibodies, antibodies that bind to self-antigens and tissue to lead to inflammation and damage. Rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP are examples of autoantibodies. T cells also stimulate macrophages, here in red, to multiply and secrete a significant number of TNF-alpha, as well as other pro-inflammatory cytokines. Macrophages also increase the production of DICOF1, or DKK1, which in turn leads to decreased activity of osteoblasts, here in green. These are the cells that lay down new bone. In addition, T cells directly stimulate osteoclasts, here in light blue, which actively chew up bone, leading to erosions. Finally, T cells stimulate the cells lining the joint synovium, known as synovial fibroblasts, here in yellow, to proliferate and also secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. The diagnostic criteria for RA include clinical as well as serologic and radiologic factors. Disease in general has to be present for over six weeks and can involve a variable number of joints, but usually smaller joints are involved in a symmetric pattern. Positive serology with rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP antibodies can help confirm the diagnosis as can elevated inflammatory markers such as ESR or CRP. X-rays demonstrating marginal erosions of the joints can also help confirm the diagnosis. A number of treatments are available for rheumatoid arthritis, all of which modulate the immune system. Glucocorticoids such as prednisone are often utilized to initially control symptoms or manage flares of disease, but due to side effects such as osteoporosis and hyperglycemia, are only used in low doses as chronic therapy. Hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine do not lead to much immunosuppression and can be useful for mild disease activity. For most patients, however, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, or DMARDs, which have been demonstrated to improve the course of disease, are necessary. This group includes methotrexate and leflunamide, both of which affect DNA metabolism and lymphocyte proliferation. The final, newer group of drugs fall under the heading of biologic DMARDs and include subcutaneous or intravenous agents designed to specifically target cytokines or cell surface markers that play a significant role in RA pathophysiology. More important than the specific drug chosen is the strategic approach to treatment of RA. 
Early aggressive therapy has been demonstrated to prevent joint damage and disability. Current RA treatment involves frequent modification of therapy, including combination pharmacotherapy when appropriate. One must also individualize therapy in an attempt to maximize response and minimize side effects. Finally, one should attempt to achieve complete remission of disease when possible, a goal that was uncommonly accomplished before the advent of newer biologic agents. In terms of the clinical course of disease, some individuals experience a variable course including intermittent flares with periods of relief. Others may experience a slow, progressive course leading to disability over time. A smaller subset of patients have a rapidly progressive and destructive course with severe joint damage. Patients with RA also have an increased rate of infection, cardiovascular disease, and lymphoma compared to age-matched populations. There's also an increased risk of early mortality, something which has been improved with therapeutics and an aggressive approach. In summary, rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory arthritic disease affecting women more than men that presents with symmetric arthritis of the proximal hand joints, along with one hour or greater of AM stiffness. Diagnosis is made based on clinical symptoms along with the presence of rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP antibodies, elevated inflammatory markers, and x-ray findings of erosions. Treatment consists of anti-inflammatories, DMARDs, and biologic agents for more severe cases. Finally, the focus on early aggressive treatment as well as newer therapeutics has led to significant improvement in quality of life and remission of symptoms in the treatment of RA. And here are some key references for you to learn more about rheumatoid arthritis.